Genesis chapter 13 is where we're studying today. Genesis 13. We started the chapter last week, but um, we didn't get much of a lesson because somebody was uh, talking way too long before the lesson started. Well, today we're going to try to get in a little bit more study. So uh, Genesis 13 is the... Um, Continuation of the story of Abram and Sarah, or Sarai, and Lot. They have left Egypt and they're coming back up into the northern uh, country, which is now Israel. In those days, it was called the land of Canaan. And the Canaanites lived there. And they were traveling back from Egypt, going back north, and went back to the place where God had spoken to Abraham, had passed on an, another promise to him, and also where Abraham had, got, uh, had gotten right with the Lord there. Well, Abraham's going back there this time to get right with God, get back on track, but something happens. A, um, a typical, normal, everyday family disruption. Same things we face, Abram faced. Let's read about it, starting at verse 1. We're going to read quite a few verses. We'll read down to the end of the chapter and uh, get the whole story. I don't know how far we'll study, but uh, let's, let's do what we can. Starting at chapter 13 of Genesis, verse 1, and Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me, if thou wilt go, or excuse me, if thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated themselves, the one from the other. And Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent toward Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward, and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. 
And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Okay, you've just seen the story related to us in Genesis of how Abram and Lot parted company. And uh, you obviously, if you're paying attention as you read, you will see very quickly what motivated each of these men and their families. What were they motivated by? When, uh, when they came out of Egypt, Abram had gotten right with God. That's obvious in his actions and his words and his response to Lot. But it's also obvious that Lot, because of several circumstances, Lot chose to look to the world. He was thinking worldly. Abraham was thinking, or Abram was thinking spiritually. Abram was remembering God's promise to him. Lot, and remember this promise was to Abram and his descendants. Lot was part of that. He could have enjoyed that too, but he chose to go another way. But if you notice something, uh, up through verse four, we see that Abram has uh, journeyed out of Egypt. In verse one, which way does it say that Abram went when he went out of Egypt? He went up. He went up. Now, geographically, you could say, well, that's because the altitude changed. And it's true. It's true. Where, where Abram was in Egypt was the mouth of the Nile River. It's flat land, almost at sea level. All right? And it's, it's the, um, what do you call it, where the rivers come out and into a big body of water? What do you call that? The Say? Uh, no, that's not what I was thinking. Thank you. Uh, the delta, where the silt and the, the land is real rich and well watered, it's green. That area of Egypt and very northern part of Egypt where the Nile River flows north up to the Mediterranean Sea, it, that whole area is, uh, they he even compared it to being similar to the Garden of the Lord. At the place, the valley that not, that Lot looked at was compared to the valley of the Lord, or excuse me, the Garden of the Lord. I'm talking about the Garden of Eden. And also compared to in Egypt near Zoar, that's that delta, that Nile River Delta where Abram had been and had gone down to because of the famine in, in Canaan. But this place that, uh, that Lot and Abram and Sarai were in Egypt was very low in elevation. So to go to Canaan land, they went up in the mountains. So to go up is accurate. When you, in, in, a, in the New Testament, when people travel to Jerusalem, they, they go up to Jerusalem because of the altitude change. But listen, there's more to it than that. When he says he goes to Egypt, he always says he goes down to Egypt. Yeah. Now you can say, well, South is down and north is up. Right, Miss Glenda? <laughs> I know. Not everybody sees the maps and the geography that way. But um, there's a spiritual note here. When you go down to Egypt, you're actually going down spiritually and you're going to the world. When you go up to the promised land, you go up to Canaan, you go up to Jerusalem, you go up to get right with the Lord. That is a step up in life. And I think that can be drawn from this language of up and down. But let's look again at verse four. He went, where did he go? Unto the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first. When you get right with the Lord, you return back where you were when you were right with God. It's a good lesson for all of us. Now remember, we're gonna make application of a lot of things here. This separation from Abram and Lot is full of applications for us today. It's absolutely packed. We can learn from this 
and we can apply this. That's why I say make application. We can apply this to our lives now. Learn lessons from others so you don't have to learn lessons the hard way. Learn from other people's mistakes. Learn from other people's wrong turns in life so that you don't have to do the same thing and learn the hard way. <coughs> right, Chance? Right. You learn. So when, when Mamma says, Chance, don't do that, that will hurt you. Or Chance, don't do that, that's not good for you. It's because she knows. She's either seen other, somebody else do it and get hurt, or she knows because it's happened to her. So she's trying to pass on something to you that will help you so that you don't have to learn the hard way. Adults, we need to do the same thing. We never stop learning. Don't ever feel like you've reached the point in your life where you don't have to learn anymore and that you can't learn anymore. Remember, we always are learning all of our lives, especially as believers. So we need to make sure that and when, we, when we're going through life, learn from other people. Learn from other people's mistakes. Learn from other people's bad decisions. Well, we're going to learn from Abram and Lot some very important lessons about family. About family. And not just family, but that can be work colleagues. It can be friends, partners in business, or whatever. The other day I, was, I said something about, I was telling a fellow, I've got to find my partner and he's over here in the woods. And I got to thinking, I, being a partner today is not what it used to be. I better correct that. I was telling a fellow that. And he just looked at me and laughed. He knew what I was talking about. I said, he's my fellow worker. He's not my partner. <laughs> because a partner can be about anything nowadays. And so we don't want to be misunderstood. All right. Verse 5. And Lot also, which went with Abram, we're in Genesis 13, had flocks and herds and tents. So Lot is well off as well. He is very wealthy. And notice verses 6 and 7 talk about uh, the strife that they had and the reason for it. The land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great so that they could not dwell together. Now, does that mean that the land of Canaan was not big enough for them to live in? Of course not. But for them to live close by each other and have friction with them and between them was not going to work. Now, notice in verse 7, and there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. There was strife between them. They were arguing. <clears throat> arguing over watering holes, which stream, which pasture field, which field of grass they could graze their sheep on, and their goats and their camels and all the other animals they had, where they could graze, where they could water, where they could shelter for the night. They were arguing because they both wanted the best, didn't they? They both wanted the best places. And neither one was willing to surrender the best place to the other. Abram had to set the standard. Yes. He had to set the standard. And he did that. Because he was right with the Lord, he was not thinking of himself first. Now remember when he was down in Egypt, did he think of Sarai, Sarai first or himself first? No. He wasn't right with God. No. He was selfish, self-centered. Thinking of me, me, me. That's how we are when we're backslid, folks. As Christians, as believers, if you're self-centered and all you think about is yourself and poor me, poor me, whoa, what am I going to do? Whoa, is me. And that's all we do. It's all we talk about. I'd say you're backslid. You agree with that? Yes. If that's all you do is, is mope and, and whine and complain and, and everything is so hard for me, then you need to get right with God. Take your eyes off self. Get your eyes on others. Get your eyes on Jesus. Quit thinking about self, self, self all the time. Right? right? It's a good lesson for us. Now, of course, I never have that problem myself. Ha ha. I'm not going to make eye contact with my wife because I know 
she's going to give me that evil eye. <laughs> the stink eye. Right, that's it. Of course, we all have that problem. We all do. Every one of us. Some to a very high level, some to a lower level, but we all suffer from it. Abram went through it. And he's the only man in the Bible who was called the friend of God. But he went through it. We all fail. We all start thinking of self. And you know, I, I don't know which comes first. I'm not sure about this. Is, is it that we think of self and then we get backslid or we get backslid and start thinking of self? <laughs> Either way, whatever, whichever one works on you first, they both are connected. When all you think about your problems and yourself and your, your uh, woes in life and you don't think about anybody else or anything else or think about how you can glorify God through this, amen, amen, yeah. glorify God through your problems. What, what, what a wonderful testimony it is when a Christian suffers and all the lost people around them hear them say is, I'm going through such a hard time. What a wonderful testimony that is. Amen, preacher. Yeah. Lost people say, I go through the same thing and I act the same way he does. I'm no different than they are. Right? Hey, set an example. Show God's grace in your life. Show God's power in your life. Show how you have victory over the flesh by not letting the flesh rule your life. Don't let the problems in life become what's most important. Come on now, let's, let's get with this lesson and let's learn from Abram and Lot. Abram and Lot had to split because there was a lot of strife going on. Why was the strife there? Because of thinking of self. Now, Abram had gotten right with God. Lot hadn't gotten right with God. Lot was still falling away. Now, I know, I know. Lot had had a bad example set for him. Had Abram set a good example for him? Absolutely not. So you say, well, Abram is partly responsible for what, for the way Lot was. Absolutely. But, um, I'm, excuse me, but Lot was an adult, wasn't he? Yes. Lot had to make his own choice, just like Abram did. Lot had the same God, the same belief, the same faith. Lot, according to the New Testament, Lot was a righteous man. He had faith in God. He believed in God. He had the same help that Abram did. The same promises were passed on to him because he's part of the family. He had everything that Abram had, but he chose the good of the world, not the good that came from God. And this strife, I believe this strife in their herdsmen came from the bad example they'd seen. I really do. And I believe that's why Lot ended up the way he did, but he followed it and and that's the way he wanted to be. And I also believe the herdsmen of these two men followed that example as well. And they were, they were having strife between them because they were acting just like their masters. Yes. Just like Abram and Lot had been acting. Now, it's no excuse, but it's still a fact. Let's keep reading. And Abram said unto Lot, verse 8, let there be no strife, I pray thee. Notice he, now Abram is the elder. Abram is the patriarch of the family. He's the boss. He's the leader. Lot is supposed to be submissive to Abram. But Abram is submiss, sub, submitting, yeah. He's showing submission to Lot. He's lowering himself and saying, Lot, I want to make this right. And he said, I pray thee, I pray thee, I beseech thee, I beg you, please. He didn't have to do that. He could have said, Lot, you take off and you get out of here right now. Get out of my face. I don't want to ever see you again. You're not welcome here anymore. He could have said that. He had every right to do that. But it doesn't mean having the right means it's right to do it. He said to Lot, verse 8, middle of the verse, no strife between, I pray thee, between me and thee, 
and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. We're family. We're family. Now there's a very important reason, and I skipped over it, but I'm going to go back to it because there's a very important reason this is important. A <laughs> very important reason this is important. That makes a lot of sense then. It is extremely important. Verse 7, the end of the verse, the Holy Spirit tells Moses when he's recording Genesis for us years later, reminds us of something. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. The Canaanite and the Perizzite, they were real tribes of people, literal. They're there, they're everywhere. They populate cities. They got families, all of that. But they were pagans. They were idolaters. They, they worshiped false gods. They didn't worship the God of heaven. They worshiped statues and idols and false gods and the planets and the sun and the moon and all kinds of other things. And I'm not exaggerating. It's exactly what they did. But these lost people who lived among them, or I should say, Abram and Lot lived among them. These people were not believers. They didn't have God guiding them. They could if they wanted, but they didn't. And all of a sudden, we've got these two families, two parts of a family, Lot's family and Abram's family, because Lot, obviously Lot had a family. We find out later when he went to Sodom, he had a family. Did he acquired that family in Sodom? We don't know. But he had a family, and he had servants, and he had herdsmen and all these people. So he had people he was responsible for, just like Abram did. These two families are quarreling and arguing and suing each other and having each other arrested and taking each other to court. And You see the picture? I'm trying to uh, use the analogy of today's problems with families. I mean, they're out on the they're out on the front porch in the front yard screaming at each other and cursing and and calling each other horrible names and and and, and all that right in front of the neighbors. You see what I'm talking about? <coughs> These two family problems were becoming a problem because of the testimony for God that they had before all these lost people, folks. This world's philosophy that says, I can do anything I want, it's nobody's business, is wrong. If you're a believer, if you're God's child, it is somebody's business, it's God's. And it is important, it does matter how we behave ourselves in front of others. It does. We, My wife and I live in a small little city community there in Scottsburg of uh, houses that are 30 feet apart maximum. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, some, some of them are even closer than 30 feet. But every one of our neighbors, all of our neighbors may not know our first names. They might, they might not. But they know who we are. They know that we're Christians. They know what we stand for. They know how we live our lives. What if Miss Glenda and I have a big argument and we go out in a front yard or we go out in the backyard? We have a privacy fence. Nobody will see us back there, but we go back there and we start screaming and yelling at each other. Yeah. I think it's going to get some attention. And I believe, I may be wrong, but I believe that argument is going to be repeated all over the neighborhood. And before the day's over, maybe before an hour's over, everybody who is home or has a telephone is going to know what just happened over at that crazy house where those Johnsons live. Oh, it'll be twisted, but it started from something that was not right with God, didn't it? It will get twisted. You're right. And it's going to get blown up and it's going to be bigger and we killed each other and all kinds of stuff. Right. But you see what I'm saying? Everybody here understands exactly what I'm talking about. These two young boys know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> You're listening. You know what I'm talking about. 
if you misbehave, you act like a, a wicked heathen, you act like a lost person, you behave badly in front of lost people, all you've done is caused a bad testimony for Jesus and for yourselves. Yesterday, Miss Lynn and I went in our neighborhood and we passed out some John Romans and some tracks and visited with some people. And you know what? If we just had an argument the day before and everybody heard it, you know, what do you think they're going to do when we walk up to the door and knock on it and say, Hi, I'd like to share Jesus with you? What are they going to do? Mm -mm, it's not going to be good. They may throw it in our face. They may throw it on the ground. They may say, thank you, close the door and throw it in the trash can. Because they're not going to listen to it. Right. Dear Christian adults, listen to me. Your testimony before this, this lost world is extremely important. Yes. It's extremely important. Don't think you can get away with acting like a lost person, talking like a lost person, behaving like a lost person, in front of the lost world and get away with it. Yeah. We will stand before God someday. Yes. Every one of us. And we're going to answer for those things. And by the way, what do you do if you have done something really dumb like that? Make it right. Make it right. Get rid of the pride. Go to those people. Go to your neighbors. Go to your family. Go to whoever is involved. And... Ask for forgiveness. Tell them you were wrong. And tell them that you, want, you would like for them, if they would, to be willing to forgive you for behaving in such a wicked way. It was wrong. Admit that you did wrong. Get it right with them. Don't leave it. It won't go away. Right. Well, I'll just forget it. They'll, they'll forget about it too. No, they won't. Never. They will never forget it. And neither will all those other people they told. Let's keep going. Let's learn from Abram and Lot, okay? Verse 8, the end of the verse, Abram reminded Lot, we're family, we're brethren. Verse 9, is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee. Notice he says, I pray thee again. He's not commanding. He's not demanding. He's saying, I'm, I'm asking you, would you please do this? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. And he says, if thou will take the left hand, I will go to the right hand. And if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Abram didn't have to do that, did he? No. But notice Lot's response. Notice what he does immediately. Verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere. A well watered plain, flat land. Remember, the biggest part of Israel is rugged mountains. Rugged mountains. Not as high as our Rocky Mountains, but they're pretty high. And they're very rugged, rocks, dirt and sand. It's rugged, dry country. They, they have rain, but then they have a drought. And they'll have rain, everything will green up, and then they'll have a drought, and everything will die. It's just a very unpredictable uh, place to live, very difficult place. Now, nowadays, it's well watered because of irrigation, modern irrigation, farming methods. It can grow crops on the side of a hill and all that stuff, but it didn't used to be that way. Only you had to pick the, you had to go to the flatland near the water where the water would run off the hills and stay in the flatland. You had to find the river bottoms and the creek bottoms. That's where you farmed and that's where you had grass for your animals. That's where you, you, you would thrive. Not up in the hill country, not up in the mountains. It was rugged place up there. Dangerous place. And it wasn't a place to raise animals and family. But Lot looked for the best of the land, didn't he? Best of this world. He noticed this well-watered, green, grass, plains down near the end of the Jordan River, which is close to the Dead Sea. And that's what he wanted. 
So Lot lifted up his eyes. He's affected by what he sees. Not what he believes, but what he sees. And notice God adds a footnote here through Moses. He adds Moses add another footnote. This was because Moses is writing this many years later after it's happened. He's looking back on it. So he knows what's going to happen. And he says, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he compares it, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. So this, the plain of the Jordan River, the river bottom land, was what Lot wanted, and it was a beautiful land. It was very, it was rich dirt, well watered. It was a perfect place to have livestock and thrive. And his animals would, would multiply, and his riches would multiply because it would be a good place for it. Verse 11, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated themselves, the one from the other. So Lot made his choice, didn't he? Verse 12, and Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan. Notice, and see I told you it's called the land of Canaan, the Canaanites, there we go. And Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. You see that? Lot went close to the cities. Actually pitched his tent toward Sodom. Now, Moses, when he wrote this, years later, he's looking back and he recounts for us, he, he reminds us that Sodom already had a reputation in the day of Lot. Lot uh, when, when, when Lot moved down there to that, that flatland, Sodom and Gomorrah already had a wicked reputation. The wickedness was already there. You can't tell me that Lot didn't know that. There's no way he would not know that. News, news like that spreads, doesn't it? Yes. News like that spreads. People who live around there know what goes on down there. They know what kind of place that is. The herdsmen and Lot and Abram and his herdsmen, they're, they're out here uh, feeding their animals and they're having doing trade and work with the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the people who lived in this land. And the news and the gossip travels. They, there's no way they could not know that Sodom and Gomorrah were like that. There's no way. And, so, and Lot chose to go that way. That's what he wanted. Dear folks, remember, don't, don't get so hard on Lot, but Lot was a believer. Don't forget that. He's not a New Testament believer like us who has the Holy Spirit living in him, but he did know right and wrong. He'd been taught. He knew what God said. He knew God's law. Excuse me, law. There wasn't any law yet. But he knew God's instructions that had been passed down from Adam and Eve all the way down to where they are now. Down through the flood, down through Noah, all the way down to Abram. These things had been passed on. They knew that. Abram knew to build an altar and offer a sacrifice and pray to God. How do you think he knew it? Because they'd been passed down. They'd been taught. Lot knew it too. And look carefully at what happened here. Verse 12, and Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, pitched his tent toward Sodom. Footnote from Moses, verse 13, but the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord. Pretty bad. Exceedingly. Exceedingly. God doesn't just throw around words to be thrown around words like we do. God doesn't exaggerate descriptions. God gives the facts exactly like they are. Exceedingly meant exceedingly. Think of the worst place in this country, in the United States of America, to live. Think about it. Think of the worst city, big city, you could live in. Now think about it. Would you want to go live there? No. no. Absolutely not. And we can, we can name a list of big cities. Almost all the big cities are that way. But some have a reputation, don't they? They're worse than others. If I said, why don't we all move and go to Los Angeles? 
Why don't we all move and go right into downtown Chicago? No. Bye. Hmm. Well, why, why don't we move to uh, the center of, of Atlanta, Georgia? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why don't we move to the, the middle of New York City? Any big city you name, you're, everybody's going to say, oh, I don't know, I might visit there, but I don't want to live there. I just talked to a lady this week who told me she lives in Chicago. She lives on the north side of Chicago, very wealthy community. And she said when she gets out of her car, she comes home from work, she's terrified to get out of her car. She's scared half to death. She's a believer. And she said, I'm terrified just to get out of my car and walk to my front door of my house. And she doesn't live in an apartment building. She doesn't live in a slum. She doesn't live in a bad community. She lives in a very wealthy, high, uh, uh, high income place. And she's terrified because every day somebody's getting killed, somebody's getting carjacked, somebody's getting robbed, and worse. And I mean worse. It's awful. But Lot chose to go toward a wicked city that is sinning sinning before the Lord exceedingly. And that's what he chose to do. And then after they separated, and this is what happens lots of times, when you get right with God, families separate from you. That's right. They do. That's right. They first will give you a hard time for it, Mm -hmm. for what you're doing. They think you're the one separating. And you are in a way. You're changing directions. Mm-hmm. You're not going to keep going the same direction you used to go. If you did, you probably didn't get saved or you're not right with God or something's wrong. But families divide and separate. Not always in a good way. It's good when your kids grow up and they go off on their own and establish their own lives. It's good. That's what we raise them to do, right? right. We don't raise them to, to, to live with mommy and daddy forever. Right. If we did, we didn't do a good job of raising them. Right. right? There's something wrong. Right? Right, Miss Patty? There's something wrong when they want to live with mommy and daddy forever. Sisters too. Sisters too. <laughs> Sisters too. And no matter how much you love them and want to help family, there's still something wrong when that happens. Yeah. It's just not right, right? Yeah. Now, uh, I, Miss Betty has a daughter living with her because Miss Betty needs adult supervision all the time. Because <laughs> <laughs> she won't behave herself. But that's different. No, I'm teasing. But you, you know what I'm talking about. That's not what we raise our kids to do unless they're helping us out. That's different. But listen, we raise our kids... To grow up, go out and establish their own lives and live for God. Not live for money, not live for a salary, not live for prestige or be popular or to be a famous. We live to live for God. That's what Christians ought to raise their kids to do. Amen? Amen. If we don't put that first when we're, and, and you don't wait till they're 16 to tell them that, you start when they're six months or six days. You start at the very beginning and you teach them that. Well, Abram had set a bad example for Lot. So you could blame Lot, blame Abraham for part of Lot's problem, but Lot still decided what he was going to do. Abram made a decision, got right with God. Lot made a decision and went the other way. And this is what happened. After they separated, verse 14, And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him. Notice that little footnote that was added there. After the law was separated from him. Lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward. And then he tells him all the other, and we'll stop right there. But listen, do you believe that Abram was probably discouraged and sad? Sad about Lot? He saw Lot move down towards Sodom. He knew where he went. He knew the direction he chose. And you can be sure Abram was discouraged and down and sad about his nephew taking his family and going down to Sodom. To that wicked, wicked, evil place. 
Why would he want to take his family? Why would he want to live in such a wicked place? And he willingly, knowingly, made that choice. It wasn't just for the watered ground and the green grass for his animals. He actually moved toward Sodom. The plains of, of Jordan was a lot more than just the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities that were in that plain. There were places there that they could have lived without being close to Sodom. But he chose to pitch his tent toward Sodom. And you know Abram was discouraged and sad about it. But God came along and gave him the encouragement. Don't forget, when, when families have problems because of evil and righteousness, when there's decisions made because of that, and I don't mean problems that we create. I'm talking about problems that come up because we make a choice to take a stand and live for God. That's what I'm talking about. Don't blame all the problems in our families on God if they're because of our own making. But if, if they're because of you making a, a stand for right, then remember, God's going to be there to encourage you and, and help you and lift you back up. And God will not forsake those that go the wrong way. We'll see that later as you already know the story. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your faithfulness and for your goodness and for your unending love. Even for us, when we backslide and when we go against you, you still love us, but you don't agree. And you don't just turn your head. Father, you notice and you take note of everything we do in this life as your children. I pray, Father, that each of us this morning will examine our lives and make sure we're living in a way that pleases you. We're reacting and acting and behaving in a way that honors you with our lives. We're a good testimony for our neighbors and our friends and our families. Help us, Lord, to be what you want us to be in this life. This life will be over for all of us very soon because life is short. So help us, Father, to live in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name, amen. you got a short break.